Koketsu ni Razumba, Koji wo Ezu. If you do not enter the tiger's cave, you will not catch its cub. Perseverance commands great respect amongst the Japanese people, and few people in history have embodied that trait more than William Adams. The fantastical world of Neo has its roots in one of the most astounding true stories of all time how a half starved Englishman turned up on the Japanese coast and forever altered the course of history. Tickle. At its core, Neo is a game that tells the story of a blonde haired Irishman named William, who pursues a mysterious man named Edward Kelly all the way to the distant lands of Japan. The real world Edward Kelly was a dubious figure who wandered throughout Europe practicing alchemy, communicating with angels through a crystal ball, and even dabbling in necromancy. By all accounts, he was a fascinating man, though in reality, he never reached the shores of Japan. William Adams, on the other hand, did. Born on the east shore of England, young William seemed destined for the sea. When his father died, 12-year-old William was sent to apprentice under Master Nicholas Diggins in London. It was here that he learned shipbuilding, navigation, and astronomy, skills that would eventually endear him to the most powerful man in Japan. By 1598, the climate in Europe was tense. The Dutch and English were at war with Portugal and Spain. The now 34-year-old William signed on as a pilot for a particularly ambitious Dutch sailing expedition. This Dutch company was to act as pirate merchants, sailing to South America, across the Pacific to Japan, and back through Indonesia, antagonizing Portuguese and Spanish trade posts along the way. Five ships would set sail from Rotterdam as part of this company, and only one would ever return. The company left Rotterdam in June. As an omen of the treacherous journey that lie ahead, the admiral of the fleet died of a fever a mere two months later in August. After some skirmishes with the Portuguese on the African coast and eating strands of rope leather to prevent starvation in the South Atlantic, the fleet finally reached the Strait of Magellan by April of 1599. Inexplicably, the captain decided to spend all winter in the treacherous strait, afraid to move ahead until the winds had shifted. All told, some 120 men died over the months spent there. At last, the captain decided to press onward only to face a tremendous storm that scattered the entire fleet. By the following November, only two ships had arrived at the rendezvous point off the coast of Chile. The surviving crew determined to move ahead with their journey to Japan. However, setting out across the Pacific would prove to be disastrous. Two months into their journey, a massive typhoon hit, separating the two remaining ships. The flagship of the entire expedition, the Hoop, was never seen again. Hobbled and starving, the crew of the last remaining ship, the Lifte, were in a desperate situation. William later wrote, Great was the misery we were in, having no more but nine or ten men to go or creep upon their knees, our captain and all the rest looking every hour to die. Finally, after four months and twenty-two days at sea, the crew of the Lifte spotted land, what they presumed to be the northernmost cape of Japan turned out to be the southernmost island of Kyushu. 24 badly malnourished men remained living, with three dying that day and three more shortly thereafter. Only William and six others had enough strength to even stand. The crew was brought ashore and met with the local king, as William put it. Portuguese Jesuits quickly arrived and claimed that the crew were dangerous pirates who should be put to death. The Portuguese, being the only available translators for the men, put them at a severe disadvantage. Finally, word came from Tokugawa Ieyasu to bring a representative of the sailors to Osaka Castle for questioning. William Adams and one other sailor were brought before the regent, who was on the cusp of becoming the ruler of all of Japan. Ieyasu peppered William with questions late into the night. He wanted to know how he came to Japan, his thoughts on the supernatural, and the state of affairs in Europe. It was on this very night that William forever altered the course of history in Japan. You see, to date, the only knowledge about Europe the Japanese had to go on was what little they were told by the Spanish and Portuguese. Naturally, they represented themselves as the sole powers of any significance from Europe, leaving no other options for trade. 
But through William, Ieyasu learned two significant truths. That the Spanish and Portuguese had been lying about European affairs, and that the Dutch weren't as zealously religious as the Catholic nations of Spain and Portugal were. You see, the Isles of Japan were embroiled in war, so there was great demand for weapons of any kind. Warlords sought after anything that would lend them a strategic advantage. So when the Portuguese came calling, offering guns and luxury goods for trade, the Japanese eagerly accepted. There were strings attached, however. The Japanese had to allow the free proselyting of Catholic missionaries throughout their lands. Initially, this was seen as a beneficial way to weaken Buddhist groups that were actively rebelling against local governments. After a century of missionaries, however, many Japanese leaders began to grow wary of Christianity's own spreading influence. There seemed to be no way to obtain much needed weapons from the Portuguese without the rising tide of Christian converts that would surely follow. That is, until William Adams arrived. The cunning Ieyasu quickly saw that he could trade with the Dutch without the need for Christianity invading his shores. Ieyasu rebuked the Jesuits, who were still petitioning for William's execution. In the end, the emperor gave them answer, that we as yet had not done to him, nor to none of his land, any harm or damage, therefore against reason and justice to put us to death. If our countries had wars, the one with the other, that was no cause that he should put us to death. The Portuguese were dumbfounded. Somehow, this insignificant band of starving men managed to scrape and crawl halfway around the world to undo their monopoly in Japan. Armed with weapons that arrived on the leaf day, Ieyasu completed his quest for power not six months later at the legendary Battle of Sekigahara. The most powerful man in Japan now trusted a British sailor as one of his closest confidants. Where William and his crew had once sought death as they drifted aimlessly in the Pacific Ocean, they were now treated as lords. William himself was made a samurai and promoted to the highest rank in Ieyasu's court, Hatamoto. He could seek audience with the shogun any time he wished, an honor afforded to very few. William would die 20 years later as lord over 100 farms leaving a Japanese wife and two young heirs. Not long after his death, in 1636, the Portuguese and Spanish were barred from the country. Christianity would be eradicated from the face of Japan and would not return for another 200 years. So, the next time you think that you can't make a difference, that one person doesn't matter, and the world is unchangeable, I would remind you of the story of William Adams. Nobody could have predicted that a conversation late one spring night in Osaka, for good or for ill, would lead to an entire religion being wiped from the face of Japan. I'll see you again next time.